fixing the money thing. We continue to answer the question, can God trust you? Now, from Faith Life Church, here's Gary Cassie. Luke chapter 8 is our, one of our scriptures. It's about the uh, sowing of the seeds story, you know, the parable of the sower. We'll start there in Luke chapter 8. We have read some of these scriptures several times over the last few weeks. We're going to dig in a little deeper with them. And verse 11, this is the meaning of the parable. Jesus had given them the parable. He's now describing, explaining it. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Who takes the word? The devil. I wonder why. Because the word never fails, that's why. It's imperishable, and it never returns to God void. The only thing the enemy can do is to try to get it out of your heart because it'll produce exactly what it was sown to do if it stays there. That's a fact. Verse 13, those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. Today's subtitle is the time of testing. Yeah, in the time of testing, they fall away. In the time of testing, they fall away. We need to talk about that. He goes on and talks about that the one who perseveres with the word produces a crop. Again, the word will always produce always produce. Now, the Greek word for testing in this scripture means putting to proof or proving something, like an experiment or a trial bringing evidence for a verdict, uh, to prove steadfastness, being faithful. Uh, it's a condition or quality of being constant or changeless. So, testing. Mark 4's version, chapter 4 in, in Mark, of the same story says, when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So the devil steals the word up front. If you hear that God heals, he'll replace it with a word that, I know a lot of people got sick and he didn't heal. He has to replace that word. He steals God's word and replaces it like Eve. Did God really say he's going to replace the word? Now, if by chance you happen to believe the word with joy, there's my answer. I've got my answer, right? He heals. He still heals. Then what is going to happen? The Bible tells us he's going to stir up trouble, persecution, pressure against the word. Why? He's trying to get circumstances to appear to you bigger than God bigger than God's ability, so that you let go of it. And so the time of testing. Now, friend, everyone goes through this testing because we know from the scripture it is the enemy's tactic that he uses. It worked for Eve. It works for many people, but not you. You're being taught the word of God correctly so that you understand to stand your ground in the day of testing. You'll stand on the word of God and you'll inherit what the word says. Amen. See, testing's good. See, people think testing's bad. Now, testing is good. We need testing. And when it comes to people, well, this, people need tested. Well, how about planes? If your ticket had a disclaimer, this plane has not been tested. We expect it to fly maybe 90% of the time. Good luck. I mean, would you, would you actually buy that ticket, right? No, obviously, we appreciate the test. How many would think that God would do the same thing? Before he puts you in a place of great pressure, do you not think he would test you first? Not test you like to test you like you flunk out. Test you so that you can make adjustments and test you so he can train you and prepare you for the assignment he has. Doesn't that make sense? Sure it does. Now, everyone will be tested. In fact, you are tested today. You passed this when you came to church. Praise God for that. But everyone is tested. All right? It's just part of life. You're being tested right now for your future. How you handle today will dictate how you handle tomorrow. And so today I'm talking about your personal ability, your personal integrity. You cannot rise higher than your personal integrity. You'll never rise higher than how you handle your personal life. Does that make sense? How you handle your life is how you'll handle everyone else's. Okay. We're going to go to a scripture we've talked about many times. Even in the last few weeks we've talked about this. But I'm going to dig something out that maybe you haven't noticed before out of 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 10. The word of the Lord came to the prophet Samuel. I regret that I've made Saul king because he's turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Then we see God speaking to the prophet in chapter 16, verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, 
How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way, because they would always anoint the king, the future king. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have, listen to this, I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Wow, that's that's pretty, pretty powerful statement. He's chosen one of his sons to be king over his nation. That's, wow, that's pretty important. Let's find out what happens. So he goes to Jesse's house, and we find in chapter 16, verse 10, these words. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. I said, are these all the sons you have? Uh, is, and, and he said, well, there's one more, the youngest. He's tending the sheep. Well, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So they sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health, had a fine appearance, handsome features. The Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. In fact, they anointed him right there that day in the presence of his brothers as the future king of Israel. Well, wow. now here's the question you must answer. Why did God choose David to be king? Yeah, he passed the test. Which test? He hadn't met Goliath yet. He hadn't even played his harp for Saul yet. He hadn't even met Saul. All right, so what's going on here, right? They took him straight out of the field as a shepherd and anointed him as king. Wow. Acts chapter 13, verse 22. After removing Saul, God made David their king. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Question, how did God know that David would do everything he wanted him to do when David had done zero for him yet? He hadn't done anything yet. He's out to take care of the sheep. Yet God testifies of him that he has my heart and he will do all that I ask him to do as opposed to King Saul. He chooses David as a shepherd. David has done nothing for God yet as far as in a position or a title. The question I ask you is, why did God choose David? How could he say that David would do what he would have him do? I mean, Saul said the same thing when he was appointed king, that he would do everything that God wanted him to do. So why, did, why is God saying, I testify of David that he would do that? Hi, I'm Gary Cassie, and you will never fulfill your destiny until you fix your money thing. Visit GaryCassie.com and don't forget to hit the subscribe button below for more amazing weekly videos on fixing your money thing. And thanks for watching.